Welcome to the Maintainable Software Podcast, where we speak with seasoned practitioners who have helped organizations work past the problems often associated with technical debt and legacy code. I'm your host, Robbie Russell. On this episode, we are joined by Lisa Crispin, who has been helping teams embrace agile testing practices via consulting, workshops, and co-authoring a number of books, including Agile Testing and More Agile Testing. Currently, Lisa is a testing advocate at Mabel. Lisa, welcome to Maintainable. Thank you. It's great to be here, and it's exciting to have a, a new podcast on the scene. I think it's such a great topic for a podcast. Thank you so much. I'm glad to have you here today. As an agile tester, can you describe how your role fits into a typical software delivery process? Yeah, I've been doing this for the about the past 20 years. I feel like yeah, the roles have evolved a bit over the years, but the idea is to help the team collaborate to build quality into the product and prevent bugs from happening in the first place, rather than focus on finding bugs, which of course we still need to find the bugs that slip through, but just trying to get the team to be thinking about how they're going to test from the very beginning of talking about a feature. How do we build testability into the code? How are we going to automate tests? Who's going to do exploratory testing? What other kinds of testing do we need? And just have that at the forefront because really agile quality and, and testing are a big part of agile development. My role is somewhat of a consultant because it's, there are almost never enough testers, dedicated testers on an agile team or any team. And so part of my job is to kind of act as a consultant, transfer my skills, help the developers and product owners and other people on the team who aren't testers learn how to do things like exploratory testing, things that they can contribute. To help on developers who are new to testing learn how to write better unit test cases, for example. So there's just a wide range of things involved. And these days with our new technology and our ability to quote unquote test in production, monitoring production use, looking at analytics, how are people really using our products? What problems are getting out there that we're not, maybe the customers aren't aware of yet? That has opened up a whole new area for testers to get involved. So getting involved in the DevOps practices and continuous deliveries, a really big part of our job now. It's interesting. You know, you, you touched on working with like helping developers improve their testing. And, you know, I was uh, typically with a development team where they're practicing TDD or maybe BDD and they're writing automated and integration tests. Are there overlaps in the types of work that you're doing and they're doing? Or is it kind of like a shared collective responsibility for the testing of the application? I advocate the whole team taking responsibility for making sure all the testing activities get done. As to who does them, that varies from team to team. Test-driven development, that's something that's mainly for code design. It's a great side benefit that it results in automated regression tests, but it's really to help the developers with code correctness. And I see shops where they have testers write unit tests, and it's like, no, that's an anti-pattern to me. But at the same time, I've, I've been on teams where I join the team and the developers are all new to TDD. They've never done testing before. They really don't know even how to get started. And maybe at best they'll do happy path test cases because that's all they know. And to pair with them and say, well, you don't want to get carried away at the unit level, but hmm, is there a negative test that you could try here? Or can you check for boundary conditions or something? Would that be appropriate here? And when I do join a new team, a lot of times if they're doing pretty good already, maybe I'll just have them walk me through some unit tests and just get a good sense of what I feel like they're covering. Sometimes maybe before they go to, they think they're finished with the story, before they go and hit the button to say, hey, show me what you did. Let's walk through some, let's maybe a little manual exploratory testing. And so I can get a sense of what they're able to cover. And then the higher level tests, like API level, service level, integration, getting into the UI level, the team's going to decide who's going to do those tests. So most teams I've been on in the last 20 years, the developers did TDD. They automated the API or service level tests, but the testers collaborated with them, specifying the test cases. So I, as a tester, specify the test cases for a story and work with the developer to actually write the fixture code to actually automate the test, you know, send the inputs to the production code, get the expected outputs or get the actual outputs compared to expected outputs. So I personally prefer that as a collaborative process because the most important thing is it makes sure that we have shared understanding of the feature. And we both understand how it behaves. And we have a question, then we can go talk to a product owner or business stakeholder or designer and get that question answered. At the UI level, the last team I worked on, the developer pair working on the story automated all the tests, including UI level tests. But most of the time I see that get left to the testers because nobody likes automating UI. (laughs) 
level tests. It's kind of a pain. And again, I like that better as a collaborative effort. When the developers do it all, they do a great job of writing test code usually because they know how to write maintainable code. But they focus on the happy path. They don't necessarily think of all the different edge conditions that they should be watching for or the risks. And conversely, if the testers do all the automation themselves, when I've been automating tests, it might have been 20 or 30 percent of my job. I wasn't doing it all day. And I started out life as a programmer, but when you're not practicing it all day, every day, you're not going to be that great at it. And so I could do an okay job. Somebody who's programming and coding full-time is going to do more maintainable code and use better patterns and practices. So again, I like to see that collaborative effort. The developers help the testers get established with good patterns, like using something like page object or screenplay patterns that make for good maintainable test code. That's great. And you mentioned a happy path a few times. And my assumption there is that that's kind of like the ideal outcome and the process that a user would go through to complete a, say, a story or to complete some sort of task that they're working through. Yeah, it's just how you expect that piece of code to behave or that feature to behave. But not necessarily throwing some wrenches into the process. Exactly. Like what happens when a user does something unexpected? I mean, in my experience, I feel like as a developer or programmer, you kind of have to have that attitude. You have to be optimistic about it. Because if you were thinking about all the terrible things that would happen, you would probably just be paralyzed. So, you know, it is proper to let's code how we want the feature to behave. But at some point, we have to make sure it doesn't do anything unexpected. Right. And do you think those are scenarios that you should bake in a lot of automated testing for a lot of those types of edge cases? Or is it when those edge cases pop up in production with users, then those are good examples of where to bake in some additional tests to help ensure that that doesn't hopefully happen again when you address that bug that might have occurred? That's really domain specific. You know, when I worked on a financial services application, and it was people's money. We really had to make sure we covered the risks. My last team was working on a project tracking system. We don't want to interrupt people's day, but nobody will die. So we were less concerned. And at the same time, though, it's all a matter of risk. And so there have been times where in nine years I worked on that financial services application, there were two times when I consciously decided not to put an automated test into the regression test suites that ran with every build for an edge case that I had thought of. Because I thought, this really is just never going to happen in production. Nobody will ever, ever do this. <laughs> and somebody did. Two times in nine years, and we had to roll back production. You know, we knew we could quickly roll back. So it wasn't the end of the world. Nobody lost any money. I think it's a pretty good trade-off because otherwise we're maintaining that test for how many years? So it's just, and you got to think of value to the customer. If it's one of their favorite features and suddenly it doesn't work like they expect, eh, that's really bad. So it's this constant analysis of risk and trade-off, which I think testers, I think that's one of the way we really contribute to teams is understanding how the customers are thinking and how to not distress them. <laughs> Let's take a quick step back to learn a little bit more about you. Aside from raising donkeys, you're a testing advocate at Mabel. What is Mabel and how does it fit into a team's development process workflow? Yeah, Mabel is a, we call it a scriptless test automation tool. And that kind of means nothing, but it's designed so that people who have not had experience automating tests or who do not write code right now can get started automating tests. At the same time, though, it's a pretty sophisticated tool. And so if you can write code, then you can probably enhance those UI tests a lot with some JavaScript snippets and things like that. So I still see it personally as something that I want the whole team to get involved with because I think it works better that way. At the same time, you know, I think people can easily ramp up and learn some basic automation practices. And a lot of what I do is to just try to put out information on here's some basic patterns you can use. Here are some basic models you can use when you're thinking about your automation strategy. One of the engineers and I have done a series on how to write good test assertions because there are good and bad practices around that. So just helping people learn that because it's not magic. And just the fact that you can easily record a user journey in your UI, it's great that you can do that, but you still have to think through how you're going to do it and be smart about it. And the advantage of Mabel to me is it runs the tests run in the cloud. They run concurrently. So the feedback is super fast, which that's always been a big problem with UI tests. We've got so much logic now in our UIs. It's, everything's so Ajaxy. So the tests take forever to click and go through the UI. But if you can run 300 tests in parallel, and the longest one takes five minutes, you've got your answer in five minutes if you broke anything or not. And the power of the cloud is just 
amazing to me. I think it's bringing on a whole new generation of test tools, plus the heuristics and using machine learning for things like auto healing the test. So the tool knows all about each UI page. And if an element changes name even or moves position, it can still find that element and keep going. And at the same time, if something visually changes on the page and it was normally static, it can alert you to that. Or if the page performance changes, it can alert you. So you know, that's kind of been the holy grail. We always wish that our tests could do the functional testing and performance testing and visual checking and everything at once. We're able to do some of that nowadays with today's technology. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to have to take a look at that myself. So in one of your books, Agile Testing, your co-author, Janet Gregory, and you talked about the differences between a customer team and a developer team and how testers have a foot often in both teams. Reflecting on your time in the industry, do you believe that there are certain traits that someone must have to be more involved on the customer side of things? Well, that's a good question. And you know, the terminology of the customer team, it dates back to the extreme programming days, which of course, that's where Janet and I both started. But I, I mean, it still means something to me. I think some people now aren't as familiar with those terms. I definitely think people as a tester or a business analyst, and I think there's a lot of overlap in skill between testers and business analysts, just being able to see things from the customer perspective, to see the value of the application and how is it helping that customer do their job. And also the value to the business. So how's the business making money? Because we all have to get paid. <laughs> and so understanding the business needs in asking, again, we're more pessimistic. So a question I ask a lot about a new feature is if we implement this feature, what is the worst thing that could happen? Elizabeth Hendrickson has a, a game called Nightmare Headlines. Like, what do you not want to see on all over Twitter tomorrow after you release this feature? So we're kind of the bearers of bad news and we're kind of pessimistic and, you know, curmudgeonly. But it's really, that's why we want to make it a collaborative effort of, we need all these viewpoints. So we need that optimistic developer. Wow. Yes, we're going to get this feature right out. And it's awesome. And then at the same time, balancing that with, well, we have these risks that we need to think about at the same time and make sure that we're comfortable with those. Yeah, I was curious about that. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts of, I know that in the software industry, there's, you know, for a long time, and I think that stereotype of a typical programmer, you know, putting their headphones on and kind of maybe being, you know, maybe not the types of people that having soft skills to put in front of customers, to be part of those conversations. And I was kind of curious if you felt like there was any weight to that over the years, or if you felt like that's just been more of a overgeneralization in some ways. You know, I hear a lot of people say software development is 20% coding and 80% people skills. And I really think that's true because when we see bugs happen, it's usually a miscommunication. The business person wanted it to work one way or the customer wanted it to work one way and the developer misunderstood and didn't talk to anybody and made it work a different way. And so I think we all need to have those quote unquote soft skills. Janet and I like to call them thinking skills because soft skills just sounds trivial. Uh, <laughs> it's really important. Also, I think people can learn programming skills and especially like once you've learned a programming language you probably can pick up any other programming language you need to pick up but I find it harder to teach people some of the thinking skills just the mindset of yeah let me jump on any problem I'll help no matter what it is yeah I really want to learn about that you can teach that to people but it's harder I feel like the technical skills are easier or at least there's a structured way to teach them and it's a little bit harder with the things that are more about communicating with people. Because then a lot of other things come into it of cultural differences, neurotypical differences. If you're not neurotypical, you're going to relate in a different way. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of different things to think about. I feel like this has been a good conversation in the last several years. And I think there's more conversations about how we shouldn't just assume developers don't have these thinking skills, soft skills, however you might want to phrase that. But it's something they can pick up at some point in their career. And one thing that I've noticed is like it's been good for my organization is that we've ended up hiring people that software development wasn't their first career. They had had a different career for 10, 15 years or so. They had made this transition. They already learned how to collaborate with people on a different business level type of thing. And I'm not saying that all developers like lack thinking skills or soft skills. It's just when we hire people that tend to already have a career working with other people and not necessarily working within a team on code all day, that they can bring in some different perspectives. And I think that's been really helpful. And I'm like, it's not something I have to train people if they've already picked it up in their life. And I think one of the common patterns that I've, I've spotted a lot over the years that where I think the stereotype can hold true is when you're, say, in a customer meeting or client meeting with folks, you're talking about maybe an underlying struggle or a problem with the software, the product you're going to build. 
maybe a client is outlining their need, developers might sometimes too quickly start thinking about how they're going to specifically solve it with a specific approach, rather than maybe suspending that desire to solve the problem right away, but to actually sit there and just think about the problem and why are we going to do something about this and then build something that we hope will address it. And we can get to the how later on. And I think that's often been like an example of where I've seen that. And I've wondered how testers or design strategists and other people, other roles in a software development team are often the ones you put in those conversations because of that. And I think if developers want to be able to participate more in those conversations, I think sometimes it's just suspending the how a little longer than they'd probably feel comfortable to. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And and I, I want to throw in here, it doesn't mean that introverts can't be developers. We can still be shy. But yeah, communication skills is more than that. I think you're right. There's a temptation to solve the problem right away because we're, you know, we're problem solvers. And that's why I really like some the frameworks that help us back up and think about what's the purpose of what we're doing. So things like impact mapping, where first you think about the why and the purpose and the goal example mapping when we're discussing user stories and and let's start thinking first of all what are the business roles like, give me some concrete examples of how those business roles behave when we start breaking it into that i think it helps everybody on the team including developers get that shared understanding of what do people really need and back up on how to implement it but i've seen product owners have the same temptation though one of my favorite stories is when the product owner came to our planning meeting and said, you know how you put in this feature to, with discount codes a while back so, so that we could give people like 10% off or something? And we're like, yeah, yeah. We were. He says, well, we need to have negative discount codes because there are some things we need to charge people more for. And we're just like negative discount codes. So it's like, okay, let's back up. What is it that you really need here? Well, it turned out they wanted to add some new services and they wanted to charge for them. We're going to solve that problem not do something crazy weird like make negative discounts. So, you know, I think a lot of people in a business were keen to get something going and, you know, it's kind of like technical. We want to cut some corners here. If we do this a quick and dirty way, we can do it faster. Instead of thinking about if we do it that quick and dirty way, we're going to be paying for it later because somebody's going to come in the team in six months and go, what is this code that makes these amount, uh, negative amounts positive? <laughs> yeah, that's a weird one. <laughs> so... I'd imagine from a tester's perspective, you might see patterns emerge in software over the years in regard to technical debt in software projects. How does your team define and talk about technical debt? You know, I'm pretty new to Mabel. And what I do know is that they try to avoid it because it's kind of a value on the engineering team of take the time and do it right. Not that there's one right way, but do it in a good way. It's worth the extra investment of time. Even so, even when you do that, you know, when you're doing something new, you don't always do it the best way. And that's happened to me on other teams where, okay, we're going to use a new architecture. We've got this terrible legacy code base. We're going to do a much better way. And we do that. And after a year, we look back and go, yeah, that wasn't so good. <laughs> so sometimes you are incurring technical debt you didn't really mean to. It's still a form of technical debt. You know, I've been on teams where we consciously said, okay, we're going to do this a quick and dirty way because a customer is really feeling pain and this customer is paying us a lot of money. <laughs> so we're going to we're going to do that, but we are going to right away prioritize a story or an epic to, to redo that the correct way. So we're not going to lose sight of it. Uh, and I think that's how most teams cope with it in a healthy way because sometimes you just have to do it. But the sad thing is I see in a lot of teams is they want to cut corners by, okay, well, we're just going to do the code and we're not going to write it. We're not going to automate any tests or we won't test it and we'll just keep a lookout in production. You know, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. And and it's a slippery slope because as soon as you start getting behind in the, some of those testing activities, like I see so many quote unquote agile teams where the testers are testing an iteration behind. So the developers are finished with the story. They pass it off to the testers. It's a mini waterfall. The testers tested the next iteration and then they send the bugs back. Well, now the developers have to test switch and remember what they did two weeks ago and fix those bugs. Meanwhile, we have opportunity costs. We're not getting new things out to production. The customers are impatient. So that's just a mess. And it just gets worse and worse. It's a, it's a death spiral. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. In what other ways have you seen technical debt impact on softwares and users? I think it's mainly that they just stop getting new value. You know, they expect a product to continue to give them 
new wonderful things. And, you know, I was on a team that did a complete rewrite of the product that took 18 months. So in a pretty competitive product area, that's just terrible. (laughs) And I admire the desire to have a better code base to work with, but I have not seen those complete rewrites ever work. I, I much prefer the Strangler pattern where it's like, okay, well, let's do the new features in a new architecture in a new way and see if that works better. I've, I've kind of forgot the original question now that I thought about that horrible experience. <laughs> in that example, in the big rewrite projects, do you find that it really helps to have some testers in that process to help manage that process really successfully? Because I think if you have that expectation of you're replacing a whole application or like how to make that like a seamless process from the end user's perspective or or to usually in that process taking this as an opportunity to cut out a lot of features and how does a tester play a role in that? Well, when that decision was made, there were no testers on the team. But I mean, later on, there were attempts to do other not so major rewrites, but rewrite some significant part of the code. And and I, uh, you know, all I did was, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the decider, it's up to the business, but I could say, see, you know, this is another thing that happened once. It's like, oh, let's rewrite, let's reactify this part of the UI. We'll reactify this feature in the UI. It looks so small. So let's, that's a three point story, which to us was like two days. During the meeting, I'm trying to like, wait, wait, but nobody would pay any attention to me. So afterwards, I started writing testing charters and I wrote, I think I wrote about 30 testing charters because they were going to rewrite it. So we had to, we had to test every single part of that feature. And there were 30 things I could think of right off the top of my head. And the product owner looked at that and said, Hmm, maybe it's not a three point story. And, you know, unfortunately they pushed ahead with it and it took six months, but all we can do as testers is provide that information because for some reason we tend to remember like, the developers just don't seem to retain. What all goes into that one little part of the app? Remember all the little edge cases and also because I also worked in customer support for that team. So it's like we remember the things customers struggle with and the customer pain points. And so we can provide that information and it's up to the business people. They can decide to go ahead with it. But, you know, after a while, they started listening to me more. (laughs) And in the end, they wanted to do another big, it was more drop the whole project and let's redo it from scratch. And I'm like, we convinced them not to like, okay, let's keep working on the old one. (laughs) Let's not drop our poor customers. And in the end, they they did abandon that effort as well. So, you know, it doesn't feel good to be right when the team did not succeed as well as that they wanted but but you know at the same time when you have a lot of technical debt because you have some of it is just having a really complicated code base and if you have a real challenging business problem to solve and your code base is really convoluted and hard to work with just because of the nature of what you're trying to do the engineers get tired of working on it you know they want something fun and new to work on and you know like there's this tendency to say okay well we were using this JavaScript framework, let's switch Java, let's do React now. Or, well, let's write everything in a functional programming language because that's new and fun. It is an attempt to try to keep the engineers engaged, and I get that. But some things are just hard, and I'm not, I don't have the answers to that. I don't know what you do with a code base that's a product that's been around for years and, and the customers like it. And it's hard to introduce new features because it's just a difficult architecture. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that, that happens in our industry where there's always new tools available for us to use. And I sometimes wonder if a lot of the motivations that the, say, the engineering team might have is prompted from, you know, desire to being curious about learning and using new technology versus whether that's good for the business or good for their own resume long term. I mean, I have developers, since we focus on a very specific technology that's not hot as it used to be a decade ago. I know that even my own team feels that way. Like, well, I'm not getting a chance to use some of this other technology. I might not be hireable or something. And it, and that's an interesting trade-off for the business to have to figure out how to like, how do we make sure we're taking care of the business, but also making sure that we're keeping our developers engaged and want to be here for a long time and, and continue to keep contributing. So it's an interesting thing to, to navigate, I think. So it happens to testers too, especially people who are engaged in test automation, because it's like, oh. I want to learn this tool because it'll look really great on my resume. <laughs> and it may not even be an appropriate fit for this particular team, right? Um, I think I think we're all tempted by that. 
Yeah. Do testing teams take on their own form of technical debt? That's say not specifically code. Well, I don't like to have separate testing teams as a rule. I think testers should be embedded in the software team because testing is not a separate activity. It's part of software development, just like coding. But that said, I mean, test automation obviously is subject to the same kind of technical debt as production code. It's just test code. And it's maybe even more serious because test code is our living documentation. It tells us how the system works. It's a great opportunity to do it in a way that's really readable and maintainable because then you can bring people, new people in the team and they just look at the tests and they understand what happens. Or operations people can look at it and say, oh, that's how it should work. Okay. So that's really helpful. I guess, like I said, that slippery slope of you're always running behind and the test, the team has slipped into a mini waterfall thing. And it's like, oh, we got to release tomorrow. What gets cut down? Well, the testing. And we really want to do a good job of exploratory testing, but now we don't have the time to do that. And so it's, you know, everybody talks now about shifting left and shifting right. You know, I think building products and building features and learning from production is an infinite loop. I like that continuous delivery model of it or DevOps model of it. And I guess you could say left or right of the loop. But in testing, we've got to be involved. This has always been true, even in waterfall days. We have to be involved from the very birth of an idea and questioning those ideas and testing those ideas all the way through to, okay, it's out in production. How are people using it? Is that what we expected to happen? Is it bringing value to these people? Is it doing things we didn't expect? And, oh, this is, we better roll it back. So, so we need to be involved through the whole thing. And it's tough because... Over the years, a lot of times testers were just people in the corner doing manual regression tests from a scripts that wasn't very valuable because we could automate that. But that's what people think of when they think of testers a lot of times. So it's up to us to raise the bar professionally and show how we really can contribute. That's great. I'd like to switch gears for a moment and talk a little bit about legacy software projects. Let's say there's an app that has been running in production for several years, but has very little to zero automated testing in place. Let's assume that most of their testing has been inconsistent manual user click testing by various people on the team over the years. That engineering team is trying to figure out how to best start taking some actions to get on a better course. Do you think that they should start more on the unit level or, uh, or somewhere higher level initially? Oh, I have lived this. My team back uh, that I joined in 2003, it was the whole business plan depended on the software and the software was terrible. (laughs) And so the company got smart. The co-founders got smart and said, hmm, we've heard of this agile thing. Maybe we should try that. And who can we hire that would be good at agile development? Oh, we hear Mike Cohn is good. I don't know if you're in the agile community, you probably heard of Mike Cohn. So they actually hired Mike Cohn. And he hired me and here we are, but he's a believer in a self-organizing team. So here it's like, here team, <laughs> I'm going to give you all the support and training that you want and need, but here's what you've got. We need to start creating new features. First of all, what level of quality do you want to commit to? That was the first question he asked us. Well, and everybody says quality. Yes, of course. It's like mom and apple pie, but what is meaningful to you that you can really commit to that no matter what happens, you're going to solve the problems and get it ha- to happen. So I think that's the key. And when the team is committed to that goal, what do you need to do? Well, we decided the XP practices have been shown to be good. So we decided to adopt those. And, you know, we were using Scrum. So we were doing that framework. So we decided test-driven development. Yeah, that's a thing. That's what we need to do. Well, that's really hard to learn. We brought in a senior developer who'd done it before, but most of the people had never done it before. So we brought in training. We had expert training in it. We had people out, they had, Mike told us, you have all the time that you need. I don't care about deadlines. I don't care about getting features out. You've got to learn how to do this, which is really what needs to happen. And at the same time, we've got all these bugs and manual regression tests to do. So what I did is I went to the business and said, what really has to work? What are the critical things that have to work in this app? And they gave me a list of like 20 things. So I went and wrote manual regression test scripts for it. And then every two weeks when we released, I divided those up amongst everybody on the team, including developers and DBA and the product owner and everybody, Scrum Master, and we did those tests together. Then I started automating the UI. I have the same test in the UI using a tool that was pretty simple. They were mainly happy path tests. It was a tool everybody on the team could live with. The developers were okay with it. But I did most of the automation and it took me about eight months to cover all those scenarios. So then we didn't have to do 
We stopped the bleeding. We didn't have to do manual testing anymore. Meanwhile, though, the developers are that much more motivated to automate tests, and they started thinking about how to design the code to make it easy to do this. And they also had got traction on the TDD. And we had decided to do the Strangler pattern and use the new architecture, which psychologically made it easier. And so, you know, after after about a year, we were going pretty good. And then I started noticing that they were checking in unit tests for the legacy code. And I said, oh, this is interesting, because you said that we couldn't do unit tests for legacy code. It was too hard. And they're like, no, we just didn't know how to do unit tests. So, I mean, I think a two-pronged approach of spend the time to do the good basic practice that you need to master and stop the bleeding with some quick and easy way to get some UI regression test production. And you don't want to leave it that way, but it, it gives you the chance to go back and start doing things right. That's great. Do you find that in software projects and how buggy or not buggy a, a software project is, is often a reflection of the organization's culture? Well, that's an interesting question. It's kind of like Conway's law, right? The architecture reflects the, the organization. I don't know, because I mean, like in the case I just told you the story about having the legacy app and redoing it, we ended up, you know, after a few years, being able to have a zero bug tolerance, no bugs out to production in the new code. So we could get there. So I think the company really, I think it depends on the company's commitment to quality. If the, if the executives of the company understand the benefit of investing in quality, and that was a huge investment. We spent months where they didn't get very many new features because the developers were learning to do test room development, refactor, and all those good practices. That was a long-term investment that that company was willing to make. I think it's more the commitment and the values of the executives of the company and that that drops down. The company I work for now, Mabel, is interesting because they're purposely avoiding a hierarchical company structure because they don't want their software architecture to slip into Conway's Law. And I find that super interesting. But again, I think it reflects a commitment. Now, it's a startup. Like, I was kind of shocked when I first started there. And even when I was a trial user of the project, which is how I ended up working there, of like, this is super buggy. Did they really release this? (laughs) But the deal was their customer support is so great. And customers can get help in a second, report a bug, and the bug can be fixed in a few minutes well, then the customers aren't really feeling pain. And when you're a startup and you're trying to get new features out, well, you don't want to get a perfect new feature and roll it out and find out nobody wanted it. So it makes sense that let's get some learning releases out. We know they're not perfect. We're going to get that feedback. We're going to do amazing instrumenting of our code so that we instrument every event and everything that happens in production. We can pinpoint exactly what happened and we can fix it right away. Or if we need to, we can roll it back right away. We've got it architected so that we can release different little parts of it and not mess up the whole thing. So even though there are bugs, I would still say the quality ends up being very high. And then over time, obviously, you know, now we're more mature and we've got better tests and we've got better regression tests. And so that's not happening anymore, but it's an evolution. And I think when the company starts with, we're going to solve this quality problem and we're going to do what's best for our customers and give them the most possible value. You know, it's not always bugs, Facebook, Google, you know, they have plenty of bugs, but the value is there for the customer and you're not paying for it. So it's a trade-off. Are there any testing patterns and or tools that you're really curious about learning more about right now? Oh, that's a good question. I know there's a wiki, a website, testautomationpatterns.org, which Dorothy Graham and Sarita Gamba monitor, and they have a new book out about the patterns as well. And there are definitely some patterns there I haven't used that I would that I would love to investigate more. Yeah, I'm always learning more about it, just collaborating with the engineers. So I'm hoping I'm hoping my Steve Vance, who I've been working on this blog series of, you know, great practices for test automation patterns, for assertions especially learning more from him because it's really great to see it from for me from a developer's perspective they have a different viewpoint they think differently so that's great so let's imagine that there's a handful of programmers out there listening to this episode right now and they have some concerns about their product that they're working on and that the product owners or managers aren't prioritizing some of the underlying technical debt in their code base for example perhaps they've heard not right now a few too many times and are feeling like it's not worth asking again what advice might you offer them on how to take some action today? Well, again, this is the ease of doing this also depends on, you know, if your management understands the value of quality and why it, why it saves you money in the long run and gets you more profit because you've got features out to customers. But I just say, try to put it in language they understand. And that's why the technical debt metaphor is so powerful because 
business people who aren't technical kind of can understand the idea behind it. It's like, it's just like paying interest. And just to break it down, I mean, you know, we've got tools now that, well, we have had for years that will kind of analyze the technical debt in your code and put it into a money value. So that's helpful. Showing how it slows you down. I think, you know, this team I was on, we made a case for doing two to three week technical debt sprints or refactoring sprints as we called them, where we delivered no new features because you can't really refactor things and at the same time you're trying to get new features out because like if your tests break well, well what broke the new stuff we were able to make a case by showing them i'm not that fond of velocity as a metric but we could show them that our average velocity over time was going down and that when we were able to do the refactoring it went back up so they could immediately see hey we're going to get things more reliable more consistent, we'll be able to predict when we're going to get the new features if we allow the team to periodically manage the technical debt. I think that's a good way to show them too. Just look for some kind of metric that shows them what it's costing them or what it's preventing them from making. I think people forget about the opportunity cost. If we have a scary code base that we can't change because every little change causes bugs that we don't detect till they're in production, we can't get anything new to our customers and they're just going to go somewhere else. That's a great point. So with that, I have a few final questions for you, Lisa. What books, aside from your own, do you find yourself most often recommending to software development teams? Oh, gosh, so many books, so many books. I really like a book called More Fearless Change by Linda Rising and Marilyn Manns. And it is a book of patterns for affecting change. So, for example, if you have the problem of we have a lot of technical debt and we're not getting time to manage it, you'll find patterns in that book that will help you approach managers and potentially affect change. And if one pattern doesn't work, you can try the next one. So I love that book. I am big on DevOps these days. And from both the testing and development perspective, I really like Katrina Kulke's book, A Practical Guide to Testing and DevOps. I think that's for everybody on the team. In terms of understanding, one of the things she really promotes in the book is building relationships. And that's kind of what DevOps is about. We have to need build relationships between different roles within our team, outside of our team. That's really important. Gosh, how can I pick just one more book? Exploratory testing, I think more people are aware of what it is and why it's valuable. But another book I think that is an easy read and really speaks to everybody, including developers, is Explore It by Elizabeth Hendrickson. So it's a really great guide to get started in an exploratory testing and do it in a really efficient way. And it's fun. So I could go on and on, but I'll stop there. (laughs) Well, great. I'll definitely include some links for folks online on the episode notes. And where can people learn more about you? Well, I have my website, lisacrispin.com. Also, Janet and I have a training company called Agile Testing Fellowship. So it's agiletestingfellow.com where we we have trainers around the world that provide our three-day agile testing training course. And we have agiletester.ca, which is our book website. So you can download chapters of our books and things like that there. And and we have a blog there as well. Uh, And then a new community site that I'm trying to get going with some friends is testinganddevops.org. And it's just to help testers learn about DevOps and continuous delivery and how can testers contribute to that. And for anybody really who's interested in how does testing fit in continuous delivery and things like that. So we just launched that recently. It just has a lot of links to blog posts and articles and books and videos and podcasts to help learn about it. And plus we've got, we've already got three awesome guest blog posts on there from practitioners. So oh, great. I'm really excited about that because I, you know, continuous delivery and DevOps is, is our future. So. Well, it's been such a delight having you on this episode of Maintainable, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's been, a, it's been a lot of fun talking with you. Oh, 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 oh.